Welcome to Interfaith Connections. I am your host, Jackie Fuller. For our first segment today, we will be talking about social action here in Virginia. And I have for our guest today, returning is John Horsch Hello. from Social Action Linking Together and David Balducci, who serves as a consultant with the organization. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on the program. Thank you, Jackie. to be here. Now, can you share with our audience what is shared work? What is that? and why should our audience be aware of this? Well, maybe I could uh, uh, tackle that one, uh, Jackie. Uh, shared work, sometimes known as short-time compensation, the technical name, or work sharing, is a layoff aversion program. The objective of that program is job preservation. Now, it's a type of unemployment benefits. For example, uh, uh, an employer, uh, rather than laying off some workers, can reduce the hours of all workers in a unit or a division, and those workers would receive partial unemployment benefits. So it combines wages with unemployment benefits. And John, can you share with our audience what SALT does, who's SALT, and how are, you, how are you guys involved in this process? Okay, delighted to. People are very comfortable with the idea of uh, direct service and uh, charity, and our goal is to move people beyond charity, and uh, we do this through something that is very uh, specifically that we're committed to, which is legislative advocacy to work with legislators because uh, there's nothing in the Bible that leaves the government off the hook and they have resources. The churches, of course, bring resources to the table, but uh, with the needs being uh, exceptional, uh, they need to partner with government and work together, and that's what we do best is build bridges between and to work together, and a staggering example of that is shared work, okay. where in order to get legislators to do something about unemployment and the, uh, the abomination of unemployment, the fact that people, uh, that it, it's very devastating to people when they're unemployed, exactly. that uh, we have uh, uh, the challenge before the legislators to work together to do something about it, and we took a very specific proposal which is called shared work, and I had the good fortune to go to a meeting and sit down next to David and learn that he is a national expert, and uh, that's where the story took off, okay. and uh, we uh, then had to uh, propose shared work to legislators and to educate them and to assure them that we would be there to uh, support it. Good. And okay. that's what SALT did and what does. And we are just incredibly happy because the governor signed our shared work bill on May 23rd. Okay. Yeah, okay. so we're in a celebratory mood. Yes, this is definitely so, a victory. Yes, so yes, I, yes, I know yeah. you guys Big are victory, very yes. pleased. And how many states have this been enacted and where does Virginia stand in that ranking? Sure. Uh, well, up until the recession, Jackie, there were only 17 states uh, that had a work-sharing law. Now, uh, what occurs is there has to be an amendment to the state's unemployment insurance law because I indicated that uh, individuals, and let me give you an example of how it would work. Say uh, you're an employer and you have five employees and you are experiencing a downturn in production well, under normal unemployment insurance law, you'd lay off an individual, one individual, to make up for that 20%. But under a work sharing plan that's improved, approved by the state agency, the cognizant state agency, in this case in Virginia, it would be the Virginia Employment Commission, uh, an individual uh, would not be laid off. Everybody's hours, though, would be reduced by 20%. An individual would receive four days worth of pay, wages, and one day's worth of prorated unemployment benefits. So we're here to herald this new law, this new law that Senator George Barker and Senator William Stanley backed for over 
three years. Wow. A lot of hard work working in the State House uh, every day while the legislature was in session. And there were some hurdles that we had to go. But uh, along with advocacy groups like SALT, who led the charge, and other groups, including business and labor and other advocacy organizations, we were able to convince a bipartisan group of legislators to, to give this bill a chance. Employers, Jackie, have to activate this program. Okay. And what we're here today is that be, to tell employers across the state of Virginia, beginning January 1st of 2015, they will be able to uh, ask the Virginia Employment Commission uh, about work sharing. They'll be able to develop a, a plan and they'll be able at their, uh, at their option to instead of layoff workers, keep everybody working when there is a downturn in sales or okay. production. Oh, good, good. Because I was wondering if it was mandatory. So this is it's a mandatory? And it's, it's optional. optional. It's voluntary oh, okay. and that's just not throat clearing verbiage. Okay. Uh, what is work sharing? What, you know, animates mm -hmm. uh, employers to this? It's simply this. The best anti-poverty program yeah. is a job. Exactly. And this is what this program does. Exactly. It keeps people working. And uh, what's very, very important, I think, uh, is that it's a home run for employers, this law, this amendment to the state's unemployment insurance law. It's a home run for workers. It's a home run for communities. And it's a home run for our government. Let me, let me explain That's if true. I can. Yes, please. For employers, everybody keeps working. And when production increases, when sales demand increases, they're able to put people back to work very quickly. Right. Now you'd say, well, why would you want to keep someone working? Well, skilled employees are hard to find. Mm -hmm. And rather than lay someone off, it, uh, uh, you can keep someone working, you can ramp up very quickly, and you save on hiring and interviewing yeah. and retraining costs. Mm -hmm. All right. What does it do for the worker? Well, a worker gets, as I said, both an un uh, wages and partial unemployment benefits. So it helps individuals and families. What does it do for a community? It maintains commerce. Right. And what about government? It lowers the total unemployment rate and it decreases the need for other social services. There is, you know, and a very important four components that benefit from this program. And employers can make themselves available to this program. They can apply for this program beginning January 1st, and all they need to do is contact the Virginia Employment Commission okay. in order to do that. Now, have you received any feedback regarding about the bill from any of the local chambers of commerce or business leaders well, I'm or glad you small, asked already. mom and pop shops, yeah. small businesses? Yeah. <laughs> John, you want to? Well, the uh, chamber was very supportive. They testified with us. And uh, they see the, you know, the value of this and the tragedy of unemployment is something that we should all be concerned about and it means that their employees are more loyal and that they uh, have continuity and that they uh, can keep their skilled employees as David had said and uh, of course uh, the, the uh, challenge now is implementation and uh, it, uh, it, the value is when the, uh, the economy gets worse so uh, this is the right time to implement when the economy is good because we have something to build on and we have time to gear up so uh, and SALT is very good about monitoring to be sure that uh, when we get something passed that it is properly implemented so we're going to be keeping an eye on it so yeah. yes. David? You want to add to that? Sure. Uh, I would like to, I think it's important here, to, it's a valuable uh, lesson in political science, mm -hmm. is that um, one of the things you, you, you want to do is the perfect cannot be the enemy of the good. Okay. And every piece of legislation has good things 
and not everybody agrees on everything in the bill, but it has to be a compromise. And what we saw in Richmond in this piece of legislation, legislation is that the Republicans and the Democrats came together. Oh, that's like rare. Uh, <laughs> under the leadership of George Barker and Bill Stanley, they came yeah. together to make this happen. In and fact, we're just uh, delighted. Yeah. We're just in delighted, fact, aren't we, uh, John? <laughs> In fact, Senator uh, Barker was a statesman. He kind of stood down and let the bill be the face of Senator Stanley, who is a Republican from Southwest Virginia who has very high employment. And so he had special credibility. So the, having it was masterful that we got the two legislators from the two different areas of the state to work across uh, the lines between the uh, the political parties, and uh, so this uh, made all the difference yeah, for us. Yes. Right. And there are other important legislators that lent a hand in this. Senator John Watkins of Richmond, uh, Delegate Hope of Arlington, Senator Favola, we could go on and on, that understood that this was, you know, this program is activated by employers, but employers create jobs. Right. And it's exactly. important to keep yeah. people working. And they do, employers across the country do not want to let their employees go. For example, Jackie, in a state like Washington, way out west, about the same population as Virginia, about the same number of employers, and the same type of unemployment benefits tax system. In 2010, 2,500 employers signed up for a work sharing program and it saved, they estimate, 30,000 jobs. Wow. 30,000 jobs. That's very significant, yeah. yes. Yeah. Now, uh, if our program is ramped up slowly, uh, estimates, uh, estimates by the Center for Law and Social Policy and the National Employment Law Project estimate that in the first year, uh, Virginia could save between 1,250 jobs and 6,300 jobs. And this means that families uh, can continue to pay the rent and go to the supermarket and buy food and the well-being of the family as well as the employee and it's good for business. And I think David has emphasized that they continue to earn their benefits during this time. Any training or any, any other benefits, they, they get the full benefit package during the time they're on uh, shared work. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and that's very important because I feel faith yes. communities are on the front lines of seeing individuals yes. and families dealing with um, being unemployed. They come in for emergency assistance. Right. Yes, that's that's exactly. The crushing effects of unemployment to individuals and families is something you don't, if you can avoid, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And employers shouldn't be indifferent to this program. This is, a, this is a, we need, over the next year, we need some willing employers to take uh, the opportunity, as other employers across the country have, and avail themselves of this program. So I want to emphasize again, if, if they'd like to talk to us, we'd be more than happy to talk to any employer about this. Uh, any of your listeners can get a hold of you and you can get a hold of us, or they can contact us directly at uh, www.salt.org and uh, send us an email and we'd be more than happy to uh, share with them the experiences of other states and other employers across the country. And I think, David, they need to go to their Virginia Employment Commissions as Absolutely. well. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, which is a statewide agency. Mm -hmm. I'd like to emphasize, uh, too, that uh, you know, uh, advocacy is uh, hard work. Yeah, and <laughs> it's never easy, it's never but easy. it's worthwhile, <laughs> and this yeah. is an example of it being worthwhile. And uh, I think we would had the good fortune of stumbling into David at a meeting and learning about it. Well, and I kind of decided, well, yeah. I asked David, I said, well, is Virginia doing this? And he says, no. And I said, well, why isn't Virginia? Maybe it's time they did it. So we decided that we, sh we would uh, take it on. Yeah. Jackie, I always like to say that uh, uh, E.J. Dion, the Washington political correspondent, is really responsible for all this. Oh, okay. I, went to this social justice conference because E.J. Dion was speaking. And I had the good fortune to sit next to John Horsch. 
and that's how really we started this. So, so uh, if EJ Dion listens to your broadcast, they're sort of responsible for all okay. the work over three years Good. that we Let's all put you know. together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's always yeah. interesting the connections that yeah. are made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because I know particularly when you think politics, and I know some people are like, well, what can I do in politics to make a difference? Because they see, like you said, the, the infighting between the parties. But when you hear something like this, this I think would make more people be motivated to get involved in the type of work that you're doing because it's very important. Jackie, you know, political advocacy is a great lesson of a, the American Federalist system. And what I want uh, everyone to know that it's hard work over a three year period. But let me give you an example of what uh, a trip to Richmond looks like. One day last spring, we met with 11 separate members of the Virginia General Assembly to talk about this, about this bill, SB 310. And it takes a lot of uh, effort in order to uh, uh, work with them and uh, allow them the opportunity to think about this issue and answer their very detailed questions. Okay. Very detailed question. The challenge for us was very special because traditionally we work with the rehab and rehabilitation and social services committee and the welfare institution committee, and this t this was a whole new cast of legislators and the commerce and labor committee that we had never worked before. So it was a special challenge because they didn't really know us that well and we didn't know them. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, but. What we had going for us is the fact that these other states have implemented this and it was proven and to uh, offer them the opportunity to uh, pass a program that is working and is proven, uh, has been proven itself in other states to do good things was a, a really an asset, but it still took three years. <laughs> you know, uh, President Obama knew about this program okay. and in his inaugural uh, President Obama indicated that he was extremely impressed with the selflessness of workers who would rather cut their hours than see a friend lose their job, uh, which sees us through our darkest hours. Unemployment is our darkest hour. Okay. And it requires self-sacrifice. Many employees would rather cut some of their own hours rather than to see another employee laid off completely. Yeah. And this is what it requires. And generally, most uh, employers are able to go back up to full strength within six months. Okay. So this is a temporary, okay. a temporary activity that employers can able, are able to utilize. And employers should think about this because it's very difficult to lose a skilled employee. Not only do they know the job, but they know how to set an alarm clock. Right. Yes. And it's extremely difficult to find the right match of employees. And this allows an employer to keep and retain his or her skilled workforce. Okay. So we're going to say it again. Contact the Virginia Employment Commission if you're an employer. Ask about this program. It's not going to cost you much more, mm -hmm. much more to uh, be involved with it. And, it. and if an employer is not involved, they will see no increase or decrease in their state unemployment tax okay. Okay. for this particular program. And I'm just curious, and I'm just going to ask this because there mm -hmm. may be a viewer thinking about this. When you think of being furloughed, is that something similar to help also keep employees employed if by cutting furlough and hours? layoff are the same thing. So uh -huh. if an employee, so if an employer is anticipating a furlough, which is another name for layoff. Mm -hmm. This employer can con now consider this alternative. It's voluntary, but uh, so often in this country, uh, employers in states that do not have a shared work program, technically called short time compensation, only had one alternative to lay people off. Yeah. Now Virginia joins the 28 other states in the District of Columbia that can offer this employer a different alternative. Employers now can consider retaining all their employees and just reduce the number of all the employees in order to make up their loss of sales. Okay. All right? 
Yeah. Uh, just a little yeah. sidebar, uh -huh. uh, and David shared this with me, that Harry Truman had said about the tragedy of unemployment that if, if your neighbor is laid off, that's a, a recession. But if you are laid off, that's a depression. Exactly. <laughs> and so that's how serious this is for the people who are affected by this. And that's why it's such a good thing is because it allows them to keep their jobs. Okay. Employers across the country utilize this program. Let me give you an example. Okay. Example from the Midwest. Vernier Manufacturing in Pella, Iowa. It embraces this program. The reason why? The president of the company says, because when they use this program, they have they need a skilled workforce. They want to retain that right. skilled. It embraces this program. The reason why, the president of the company says, because when they use this program, they have they need a skilled workforce. They want to retain that right. skilled workforce in Little Pella, Iowa. They don't want the people to move to the bigger cities or Chicago or Omaha, and they want to retain uh, those workers. And the important thing is they can quickly ramp up and they can beat the competition mm -hmm. when the economy impro improves. Right. It's very important to keep your team together. Exactly. To keep very your important. team together. And this allows the employer that option. And now, beginning January 1st, we have that in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We have a new opportunity for employers to keep their team together. Awesome. And we're very right. happy about that, aren't we, John? Yes, yeah. we are. We're in a celebratory mood. Good, good, as you should be. Yes. Now, we want to show some photos of you guys in action. Okay. We have one picture of John at the podium, and then we have another picture of David speaking, as well as, it looks like, a, I know it's not like a, game scoreboard, but it's a scoreboard. Can you explain yeah. what's happening in those three photos? Well, basically, we are uh, frequently, uh, we, as David said, we visit legislators office to office, but then we go to committee hearings and uh, we speak to our legislation. Our patron calls on us. And so uh, we're there. Uh, different legislators have different styles. Some right. of them do the speaking and then call us to on the hard questions <laughs> but uh, uh, others uh, want us to lead off speaking and uh, so that's uh, and the electronic scoreboard is the bill when it comes to the floor it has to survive the subcommittee and the committee both in the house and the senate and then go to the when it goes to the house uh, uh, to the floor for a vote there's this big electronic board that records, for example, there's a house, uh, 100 uh, delegates and it records their votes and usually they have about 30 seconds to vote. So you got, if you're in the uh, gallery, you gotta really be on your toes too because there's spirited, um, and in particular in our bill, it was very spirited on the floor and, and um, anything could happen and we were biting our nails and then all of a sudden all, they call for a vote and, and it goes up electronically. So, And that's on our, uh, the electronic uh, vision of that is on our uh, website, yes. Okay. Jackie, one of the hardest things to do in American federalism is to pass a law. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Very, it was yeah. made that way. Madison's idea was to make it difficult. And one of the things you need to do is you need to be ready, you need to have the expertise, and you need to wait and wait and wait. And what occurs is in, in this, you not only have to uh, uh, gain approval of many of the legislators, but you have to make it through different committees, both in the House and in the Senate. And for any bill, and this is what it requires for this particular bill, it also uh, required approval or assent by a quasi-governmental body called the Commission on Unemployment Compensation. We had to testify before them as well. Three yeah. different times. And I like to say what David's talking about is that we have to have persistence and patience. Yeah, and a lot of both. Okay, <laughs> yes. Good. And for our final photo, we have the group photo. Where was that taken? Same 
That was taken in um, uh, Delegate Oreck's office, okay. yes, and he put in the bill for us, a very special bill that's very important. Good. Good. And when we visited with him, I noticed uh, somebody going down the hall very, uh, as I looked out the door, and then suddenly that person was next to us, it was the governor. Ah. <laughs> so ah. anyway, uh, <laughs> Virginia's kind of, uh, the kind of place where everybody gets into the act. Exactly. Yes. You know, we're so delighted that Senator Barker and Senator Stanley and all the colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle uh, participated in making this dream a reality. And there is a long runway to legislative action. We went uh, through three years of educating and working with each member in order to convince them that it was the right thing to do. Okay. Now, what I want you to know, though, is that we weren't doing this in isolation. Okay. Uh, during 2010 to 2013, 10 other states enacted legislation, uh, work sharing legislation. Okay. And six of them were, were headed by Republican governors. Okay. So the no. issue, as Senator Barker said, wasn't a red state or a blue state issue. It was an American issue. Exactly. And work sharing is an American issue. And we also had to work very hard to keep it at the policy level so it didn't get into the political the, yeah, level. Yes, 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 gotcha. yes. Well, thank you so much, guys. Well, we're we delighted to be on. here. Thank yes. you. And on one final call, how can our viewers get in touch with you? We have a website. Uh, it's s-a-l-t.org and uh, my email is jhorsh, everybody knows how to spell that, h-o-r-e-j-s-i <laughs> dot uh, at cox.net. Right. Yes. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it so on. much. Yeah, thank, thank you. It was a pleasure. Yes, about thank, this. thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it very much. We enjoyed right. being here. Yes. You're welcome. Thank you. And we'll be right back with Interfaith Connections. We know where they've taken her. In a defining time, amid a noble quest, a bond is forged. Imagine what a little time can do for your family. The princess is sleeping. Oh, sorry. Excuse us. From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Welcome back to Interfaith Connections. I am your host, Jackie Fuller. For our second segment, we're going to focus on religion TV game shows. I know it's still kind of a foreign concept for us, but they're out there. And we have in the studio for this segment is Aaron Lloyd Belcher. He is an aspiring TV game show host, and he has created a program called The Christian's Challenge. And again, we have Reverend Ogan Holder, definitely a regular here on our program. And we're going to go into some dialogue about this very unique thing that's happening in our media world. So Aaron, we'll start with you. Okay. Can you ex give us a brief like, background information about yourself? Sure, uh, my name is Aaron Belcher, as you've already said. I've uh, worked in television now for oh, going on probably 12 years now, now that I think about it. Always had a passion for ministry, and especially in the ministry of game shows. Mm -hmm. It sounds funny mixing ministry and game shows together, but it does work. Uh, for the past 20 years, I've been a youth leader uh, at my church in Tacoma Park and have had the great opportunity of doing that and just want to spread my ministry even more. Okay. And what is the Christian's Challenge? The Christian's Challenge is a Bible-based, fast-paced game show. And what it does is we invite our contestants, nine contestants, to come into studio, answer questions about the Bible, 
in an effort to win $10,000 towards their ministry or, or fund. Let's say if your church is trying to raise a couple thousand dollars to, let's say, purchase a new church organ, the Christian's challenge is there to help you raise that money. One of the biggest uh, needs for any ministry or organization are resources, are funds, and those funds are hard to come by, especially if you're, if you're just relying on your congregation and the occasional bake sale or fish fry or what have you. It's tough to get money. Our organization, our game is geared for those smaller grassroots organizations to help them get the money that they need to keep that ministry going. And how long have you been doing this project and what has inspired you to keep moving with this um, Gabe show? The Christian's Challenge was born, I want to say, in 1996. So we're going on 20 years now. I did it as a live program just among the youth in our church and surrounding churches just to get youth re-involved with the Bible, to see that it's not just to be read and to be dictated, but you can actually have fun in ministry. It's, it can be fun to read the Bible and to learn more to, than to share what you've learned. As far as what's gotten me through these past 20 years, I've always wanted to be a game show host. I am 36 years old and for the past 28 years, since I was eight, ever since I saw Bob Barker on The Price is Right, I knew that's what I want to do. And as I've grown and developed over the years, I said, well, why not put my passion for ministry and my passion for game shows, how can we put those together and have some fun with it? And through that, the Christian Challenge was born. Okay, and since this is an interfaith-focused program, do you have to be a Christian to go on this program, or is it open to anyone? It, the program is definitely open to anyone. If the devil himself wanted to come and audition <laughs> to be on this program, I'm not gonna say that his, his chances of getting on this show are gonna be good, but give it a shot. You don't, but to answer your question, in all honesty, you don't have to be a Christian. Okay. You, you don't have to be of any denomination to know the Bible and to be able to play this game. As long as you feel that you can compete, you've got a worthy organization, then you can come on this show and compete. Okay. Good, good. And have you pitched the show to the networks? We've started pitching it to several networks and we have not received too much favor in the eyes of those networks. Um, it's difficult to get a show on regular TV nowadays. There's so many networks and there are so many shows. Right now I think there are two other uh, game shows that involve churches that are on mainstream networks and some may see it as competition. I don't think every network that's out here out there that has opened their eyes to see that there's more than one way as my grandmother would say to skin a cat mm -hmm. you can preach to more people uh, than than just what's on the air now mm -hmm. there are different ways you can do it, and the Christians challenge is an alternative to the other games that are on there now not necessarily to be a, comp a competitor but there's another way there's another show that can be put on for people to watch and enjoy and be a, and feel a part of. Okay. And what have you learned from this experience of doing all this TV production work and the pitching and so forth? It is not as easy as it looks. <laughs> it can seem very simple to come up here and sit behind a desk and talk to people with cameras all, and lights all around you. It looks very simple. It is not. And I learned in taping the pilot for the show for the Christian's Challenge that it was very different than doing the live shows mm -hmm. that we did at churches. Having to get sit down and get made up and to go through just the arduous process of preparing for a show and making sure that everything is just right. I mean, you know more better than anyone. Once you do a live production, that's it, it's done. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing something to tape, uh, to pilot, you have to go over it again and again and again and again. and if anything, my patience has definitely developed. So when these networks don't return a phone call or an email or they don't call me back because they may not like what they've seen, I, I just say, you know what, all right, this is not the network for it. We mm -hmm. just move forward and we find another. Okay, now this is open to both of you. What is your opinion on the current religious TV game shows that are out there? There's um, America's Bible's Challenge and It Takes a Church, which I just come across recently. What do you think of what's out there now versus maybe it could be done in a way that couldn't be a, a bridge builder 
maybe not having the devil there, but <laughs> it could be a bridge builder, particularly for um, those of us from various faith traditions and, and belief systems. Well, um, I would say in that interfaith question context, to make a show that perhaps is an interfaith show that brings on um, questions from different scriptures, from different religions, um, different spiritual paths. And so it's just not about the Bible or not just about uh, Christianity. That would, I think, probably give it a little more mass appeal. And if someone is already uh, you know, watching and brought into the program, then maybe a Christian would be willing to sit down and watch the show when someone from another faith is on and learn about that faith. Okay. That could be one way to go. And it's, it's interesting because I've come across people from various faith traditions that's very like keen of knowledge, very knowledgeable about the Bible versus, mm -hmm. it was like I like to say, I grew up in the Catholic culture, but and now I'm in the new thought, kind of like spiritual independent community and just seeing how people who are very knowledgeable about the Bible could go on a program like yours and possibly like win the top prize. So it's very fascinating to see how all this is evolving in the form of entertainment as well. And with these type of game shows, do you think it's a way to get people back into church or develop a um, spiritual life based on what they're seeing on these programs? Well, personally, I don't think it's these shows are designed to get people back into the church. Okay. I think with the American Bible Challenge, it is designed to be, a, I, I honestly think it's a show that's designed just to try to get the Christian audience in the door okay. uh, to, to television, whereas there was no, you know, there okay. wasn't a show for them to right. watch beforehand. I don't think they're goal is to get people in the church because they're mm -hmm. not promoting a specific religion. However, they are promoting people to go and read their Bible, which is always awesome mm -hmm. because in watching these shows, there's always something that you did, may not have known. And just from flipping through the channels and maybe catching it, you just see it's like, hey, I didn't, I didn't realize that was in the Bible. Let me go and check that out for myself. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully that's what people are doing. There's another show, um, the It Takes a Church, mm -hmm. uh, that you mentioned. They're a dating reality show. Mm -hmm. It's a very different take on what we've seen, you know, coming up with Love Connection and all right. the shows that were on the air of how people connect. Uh, I think that's an awesome program for, uh, for a church family to really get involved in helping someone find love. And isn't that where you're supposed to go to find love as a church? Well, let, let's, let's think about it, but depending on your church, and that particular program really s stood out to me because if you look at the age demographic, if you have people within the same age demographic, it makes it easier. So if you go to a church that is predominantly older with only a handful of people in our age range, mm -hmm. chances are, not so yeah, <laughs> you have to go elsewhere. But it was just fascinating to see how supportive the congregation was in helping the individuals find someone to date, which was really, I think, was really awesome. Mm -hmm. um, it it is, and and I kind of have a cautionary mm -hmm. uh, tale or attitude towards you know the, like the Bible challenge and even even this uh, Bible, sorry, the the Christian dating show is that. Um, while it's really important, I think, in any faith tradition to know your, your <laughs> text, your sacred text. For example, I grew up in a very uh, traditional Christian environment as well, and as a kid, we would, we would play like Bible wars where we would, you know, two people would stand uh, facing off each other and we would just quote verses back and ah, forth mm -hmm. and, until, you know, somebody ran out of <laughs> verses to, to quote from memory. Um, yeah, fun times. Mm -hmm. um, but, but part of the the cautionary tale I, I always have for, for folks is in this, is there a further development of the Bible knowledge? For example, it's great to know scripture, but are we aware of the context with which the scripture fits in? Mm. Are we aware of the relevance it may have for our lives today? We can qu quote a lot of scripture, but the Bible, again, when we don't put it in its proper context, can come across as a book that for, you know, I'll, I'll pick something at random that, that 
speaks against equality of women or right. equality of sexual orientation. Um, but when we realize that you know the Bible was written in a contextual time, mm -hmm. certain people at a certain time in a certain place, and this was how they viewed their spiritual experience. You know, it, it sometimes we have to balance the, the the both things out. So it's not just about you know I learned this verse and I learned this text and therefore this is what it has to be, but but put it in a bigger picture as well. And I think a part of that bigger picture is that uh, these shows didn't exist mm -hmm. five years ago. There were no Christian game shows on the air. There were no Christian dating shows on the air. You had, uh, you had Christian dating websites, right. but never on this magnitude. I think the sad part about it is that these shows are on networks that aren't necessarily interested in proselytizing. They're not interested in creating new Christians or bringing people closer to Christ. At the end of the day, it's about ratings. It's about money. If these shows begin to fail, they will be cleared off the air just as fast as they got on. It's not a perfect system, mm -hmm. but it's better than what we had before. I think uh, as we were coming up, the only way people believed that they could get the message out about Christ was just to preach, just to talk at people not talk to them, not get to know them, get to know what their, what their ministries are about, but just preaching at people. So that's why you turn on these Christian networks today and all you see is preaching. There's other ways that you can yeah. preach the gospel. There's <laughs> other ways that you can reach folks. It, it's unfortunate that these shows had to come out on Game Show Network. Mm. Uh, they should have come out on these religious channels 15, 20 years, 30 years ago when they first started. Like I said in the beginning, they're not perfect programs, but they're there. It's a mm -hmm. start, and we can only work towards perfection. Okay. We have a clip of Aaron's show that we want to focus on so our viewers can get an understanding of what Aaron's doing. And um, if you take a look, this will give you an insight on how the process of this particular game show is um, presented in television. So let's take a look. Oh, thank you so much. I can't begin to tell you how wonderful it is to have you all with us. Thank you so much for joining us right here today on The Christian's Challenge, a brand new game that is going to give one of our six contestants the chance to win up to $10,000 for their charity or organization. My name is Anthony Hackett. I'm Nicole Bryce. Originally from Denver, Colorado. My name is Daniel Juarez. I'm from Camp Springs, Maryland. I'm from Brownsville, Texas. My name is Travis Cox. Hi, I'm Summer Green. And I came all the way today from San Francisco. My name is Tashelia Alford. I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland. I'm from Washington, D.C. I'm actually here to uh, raise money for a uh, faith-based, independent filmmaking company that we're looking to start. A lot of troubled youth in my community. I'm a youth leader at my church. It would just be an amazing opportunity to take the kids somewhere and, and get away from them. We are specifically raising money for the youth and the children in our community who are homeless. I have a dance ministry and I really want to make sure that I can donate this money back to the children. So I'm here to help raise money for my drama team. I'm crazy excited to be here. I think my wife is a little bit more excited than I am. Absolutely I'm excited to be here. Who wouldn't be excited? Uh, I don't want to go home and lose because you know I got to hear her lip. I think I have what it takes. Thousands of miles to get here. I'm absolutely excited to be here. I think I have what it takes to win. I'm so excited to be here today. I am so excited to be here on the Christian Challenge. Woo! I'm excited. These six players have come to this studio today to try to fulfill all of their dreams for their organizations. And let's meet them all right now. Contestants, how are we doing? Yeah. Welcome to the Christian's Challenge. It's good to have you all here with us. Are you ready to play? Yes. Yeah. No, I don't think you heard me. Are you ready to play? Yeah. Well, good. I heard that, Anthony. And you know what, Anthony, you're up first. Come on up here. We're going to do a little bit of team building right now, Anthony. Let me explain how our team building works for you and for our audience at home. We've got a board with nine numbered squares on it. And behind each of those squares is a color. And what our contestants are going to try to do right now is they're going to try to find the color so they can become the team captain. Nine numbers up on that board. Which one do you want to...
folks, we're back. We are back. And I am so glad that you're with us because we've got a fantastic game and we're ready to play it. Let me just brief you on what's going on. We've got six fantastic players over here who just went to our big board to pick out their perks because what we do here on the Christians Challenge is our teams play for points and how they gather those points are from these nine categories right over here on this board. And they are Genesis, Second Kings, Luke, Amos, Ezekiel, First Corinthians, 1 Timothy, Nehemiah, and Deuteronomy. Now that you know the categories and they know the categories, let's get started with our game, shall we? We're gonna start down here with our green team. Woo. All right, all Money right. Money team, all right. Anthony, you're up. Which category would I start with? Oh, I love Genesis. Let's go with Genesis, please. First question in the book of Genesis is worth 50 points to your team. You can consult with each other. You have three seconds to give an answer, okay? Here's the question. Methuselah was how old when he died? Was he 969? 1,087 or 872? Three seconds. All right. Um, I know he was really old. True, but that's not the answer we, we need. 969 years old. And 969 is correct for 50 points to your team. Good job. Down here to our heavenly, uh, heavenly winners. Nicole, you're up. Which category would you like? Uh, let's go with Luke. First question from the book of Luke, which is worth 100 points to you. Here's the question. Name the village that according to Luke 24, 13 is seven miles from Jerusalem. Is it Nazareth, Amos, or Bethlehem? You got three seconds. We're gonna go with Bethlehem. Ooh, sorry about that. No, no, oh. no. The answer to that is Amos. Good try, it's okay. You got another chance coming. Let's move on down here to our red team. Red team, you ready? Yes. Absolutely. Awesome. Tashilia, you're up. We need your category, please. Let's go with Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, first in that category for 50 points. Here's the question. What did the Lord write the Ten Commandments on? Was it two stone tablets, two pieces of papyrus, or two bronze plates? Three seconds. Two stone tablets. Two stone tablets is absolutely right for 50 points. You're on the board. Fantastic. Good job on you guys. Now we're going to come on back down here. Summer, you're up. Still got a bunch of categories up there. A lot of questions, a lot of points to be uh, given out. Where you want to go? Let's go with Amos. Amos, first in that category for 25 points. Amos was among the sheep breeders of what town when he had his visions? Was it Judah, Tihon, or Damascus. Three seconds. And remember, you still have your hints and your your perks, your trades. Yeah, let's do that. All right. We're gonna change the category. Change the category. Where you wanna go from here? <laughs> oh. um, so let you Second King. Second King. The point values changed. Seventy-five points for that question. Good trade on your part. How old was Hezekiah when he came to power? Was he twenty-five, twenty-six, or twenty-seven? Three seconds. 25. 25 for 75 points. <laughs> Danny, Danny, you're up. Pick a category. Let's go with Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. I think that's the second in that category for 50 points. Here's your question. What did the people believe would happen to them if they heard the Lord God's voice? Was it live forever, die, or go deaf? Three seconds. Can I get a hint? You sure can. I'll take one of those away. It was either live forever, or die. Which one was it? We're gonna say die. Oh, that's unfortunate, but it's right. It is die, yeah, <laughs> for 50 points. Good job on your part. You wanna have the winners coming up. Travis, you're up. Uh, let's go with Luke. Luke, here's your question for 50 points. Here you go. To where had Jesus led the apostles before he ascended to heaven? Was it Amos? Galilee or Bethany? Three seconds. Uh, we're going we're gonna to say Bethany. Good job, you said Bethany, because that's worth 50 points. Good job on you all. 50 points more for you all on the board. Want to come back down here? You got 100 right now. Back here, Anthony, your board. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, please, please, please give me First Timothy. For 100 points, put your way up there. Here's your question. What land did Paul urge Timothy to stay in? Was it Ephesus, Macedonia, or Crete? Three seconds. We're gonna use a hint. Definitely. Okay. I'll take away one of those answers. It was either 
Ephesus or Macedonia? All right. Yes, sir. We're going to go with Ephesus. Good thing. 100 points for you all. Good use of that time is up for this round. And in the lead, the green team has 225 points. The red team has 100 points. Blue team only has 50 points. Blue team, we got to say goodbye to you just for right now. But one of you could come back. And let me tell you how that's going to happen. You all go online. You all at home. Right there, right now. Get on your computers. Go to Facebook, Twitter, or on our website, thechristianschallenge.com. You can vote for one of those two players to come back to be our redeemed player. So while you're doing that, we'll do this. We'll just sit here for a few minutes. We'll see you when we come back. Stay with us. Thank you, Aaron, so much for providing those clips. It gives us a better understanding of what your show is all about. And it's still interesting to see how the formatting sometimes when you hear the answers, you're like, wait, but yes, the Bible, you know, with the different, how the times and sort of things are lapped in there. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting and very engaging at the same time to keep your audience interested. I got to tell you, I'm an ordained minister and I probably would not have gotten all, I know I would not have gotten all those right. <laughs> Notice how I'm sitting on one side of the podium and not the other. If I played my own yeah. game, nine times out of ten, I would lose Pro phenomenally. As well. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, and for the last question, um, well, actually two, can you explain briefly your faith tradition and how can our viewers find out more about your production? Well, sure. I am a member of the Tacoma Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is, which is in Tacoma Park, Maryland. It's been around for, let's see, probably 110 years or, or more now. Uh, with the Adventist religion, and that can definitely be looked up online at www. I think Adventist.org is where you can find that. Mm -hmm. But as far as the Christians Challenge, uh, our uh, my game show, you can find that at the Christians Challenge, all one word. dot Tumblr, and that's T U M B L R. dot com. Okay, sounds good. We know Ogan. Feel free to. <laughs> <laughs> do your thing you know, as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm the associate minister right now at Unity of Gaithersburg in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and our church is uh, celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. Oh, and the Unity true. movement, which is um, a worldwide non-denominational movement, um, has been around for about the same amount of time, uh, just over 100 oh, years. Wow. So some coming there you go. Too. So you can check me out, <laughs> univegifersburg.org, or me personally, do a bunch of other stuff, as you know, on a, at oganholder.com. Okay. 200 years of ministry right here. Yes, yes, yes. the by. knowledge, I love its power. <laughs> Throw you in here at <laughs> <laughs> And of course, you know Interfaith Connections. You can follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com forward slash IFC TV show, or go to the website at www.interfaithconnections.com. .squarespace.com. And thank you so much for watching. Take care and enjoy. Bye-bye. <laughs>